I know you steal batteries you don't need, and you push away anyone who's willing to put up with you, because just a little bit of love reminds you how big and empty that hole inside you actually is. I said shut up! I know them scientists what made you never gave a rat's ass about you! I'm serious! We will soon meet these scientists in Volume 3, a plot only made possible because Rocket steals batteries he does not need in this movie. The whole story does not happen without that inciting incident. So why does Rocket really steal those batteries? As we rewatch these Guardians films to decode why Rocket is, in James Gunn's words, the secret protagonist, I think I finally figured out why. I'm Eric Boss, and this is The Deep Dive. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 follows up the first volume's love letter from a mother with a backhand from the father. Both stories telling us quite a bit about celestial bloodlines and what it means to exist. Like last week's analysis, I have once again found a ton of new details, things I can't believe were there hiding all along. The best way to support this channel directly is to grab one of our 89P13 Rocket Science shirts at nerdriot.shop. It has some great Easter eggs, and who doesn't want to give a trash panda a self-hug? Like Volume Volume 1, Volume 2 opens with a flashback to Missouri with a song from Meredith's mixtape, this time from the Awesome Mix mixtape Volume 2, 1972's Brandy, You're a Fine Girl by Looking Glass. The song lyrics are about a man who leaves his woman behind because his life, his love, and his lady is the sea. The call to adventure, which Ego later rationalizes for why he left Meredith behind. Peter, this is the sea. <laughs> That Ego will use this to crush the last remaining vestige Peter has of his mother is the most awful thing, but he even whistles this song as he pees. When Peter's real daddy, Yondu, whistles, it's a duet with his shaft, too. Here in Missouri, the cooling towers of a nuclear power plant are on the horizon. It's interesting how the opening shot has a fuel source, because Ego is seeking a fuel source by being with Meredith, a battery that he can use to power his expansion. Batteries and our destructive uses of them are really the fuel of this movie. Ego here is played by a D.H. Kurt Russell, John Carpenter's The Thing era hair, using the stand-in of Aaron Schwartz. That was a kid in Heavyweights, but now, total smoke show! That's why Russell's smile looks a little bit unlike his, but James Gunn smartly hides this by initially covering the VFX face behind a windshield, so we don't inspect it as harshly. A good rule with using VFX magic when it comes to faces, always put them behind something at first, or introduce the character doing something cool and active, so that we're less likely to fall into the uncanny valley at first. They park by a Dairy Queen, which later gets overtaken by Ego's goo. In the parking lot, it's a cameo by James Gunn's late pup, Dr. Wesley Von Spears, who cameoed in the opening minutes of Volume 1, and Ego's car color scheme are the same colors as Peter's vessel, the Milano. Though, as we'll see in Volume 3, Peter left Earth before he learned how to drive a car. Ego says to Meredith, Come on, this way, my river lily. Come on. My river lily? Odd thing to call her. But perhaps he hopes this river will flow out to the sea with himself as the seafarer. And later, when detailing his past with Meredith, he depicts her wearing a dress with what on it? River lilies. He shows her his extraterrestrial plant, his own presence already taking seed in planets across the galaxy. And as we push into this plant, it's so unsettling the way it twitches as it grows. Like, we can tell here that there's something off about this plant. We later learn in Eternals how celestials reproduce by planting seeds inside of planet cores and then hatching out of the planets like eggs. And that is essentially what Ego is doing. We push into macroscopic imagery of its cellulose, but it's red like blood cells, zapped by blue light. Kind of like we are seeing the moment of conception of Peter Quill. And from this, we transition into the Sovereign. One of my favorite planet designs when we see it from space, it's just a collection of conjoined planets and large sections of these surfaces covered in gold. This civilization is not not known in the Marvel comics, it's an original creation that James Gunn based on Flash Gordon and Cecil DeMille's Cleopatra, and by building a new location, Gunn could establish new rules and importance to his characters, and from a plot structure standpoint, the reason the Guardians are here is because of these Anulax batteries. That's why the Abelisk is attacking and trying to feed on these batteries, and we find out later Nebula was arrested for trying to steal them, and Rocket cannot help himself from stealing them. They are the forbidden fruit of this movie, because Anulax batteries are considered the most powerful and most valuable form of energy in the universe, and I wonder if they could be celestial derived as well. It would make expense as their explosions are one thing capable of destroying a celestial brain later on. Now the frame store artists who designed these put a ton of detail into the Anulax battery, including a double helix filament coil of tiny fuel cells intentionally made to look like DNA strands, and brass colored parts with hieroglyphic markings. The idea is that each of these have an ancient weight to them, and each tiny cell might be its own galaxy or universe, like imagine the microverse battery of Rick and Morty. Either way, by wielding one of these, you're essentially playing God, like the Celestials do every day. I mentioned in my analysis of Volume 1 that the coordinates of most of the planets have been confirmed to be part of James 
Gunn's master Easter egg that he has said is actually across all of these films. The community of Deciphers I mentioned before have translated the one for the Sovereign to Biomedical Clinic 89P13 and others to Half World Cage C, that's one for Bearheart, and Wyndham Built Earth, that's for Ego's Planet. The coordinates setting up the big twist of the next film in which Rocket 89P13 got his start in a Half World Cage on a counter Earth that Wyndham built. So it's now three months after the events of the first film and the Guardians are taking gigs like protecting these batteries from the Abelisk. Peter scans it using this device, which is a modified 1977 Mattel electronic football game. Rocket is rigging up Peter's Walkman as speakers so they can listen to music as they fight, which is kind of a meta nod to James Gunn writing in his soundtrack to the script and having the actors listen to these songs while they act out the scenes. The music in these movies always comes from a diegetic source, and in this case, they VFX the speakers vibrating to prove that it's actually coming from an in-context source in the scene. The music is Electric Light Orchestra's Mr. Blue Sky, which Groot dances along to, James Gunn once again doing the mocap for this dance scene, which makes it even better because the moves aren't really that impressive. It's just like a Midwestern dude rocking out in his apartment. Groot is essentially reenacting Peter Quill's opening Come and Get Your Love Dance from Volume 1. Dancing is so important in these movies, and Drax and Peter later discuss the distinction between dancers and non-dancers. There are two types of beings in the universe. Those who dance and those who do not. Mm -hmm. This is a running metaphor that I've used to categorize all MCU characters. I actually went into this in my Loki deep dive. Tony Stark, dancer. Steve Rogers, not dancer. Not until the end of his journey. Peter Parker wants to be a dancer, but keeps getting pulled away from the dances. You get the idea. Groot here, total dancer. And for dancers, they can sometimes escape into their own happy places like this, blissful to the danger around them. Here, Groot freezes when Drax sees him, calling back the end credits scene of the last movie, and knowing that Drax and his wife were not dancers, and he doesn't want to alienate his friend. Gamora shouts, Groot, get out of the way! You're Hurt. Hi. Yeah, I love the little wave he does, and how Groot shares little duet dances with every guardian until Drax wrecks the speakers. And notice how Groot in the background stays mad at Drax throughout the movie, repeatedly hitting him, like even when Drax saved him from flying into space, and then another scene later, until finally he nuzzles up against him at the end. The Orloni shakes Groot off him, and Groot tumbles into the camera, making a ding when he hits it. The sound mixing in general is great. Like when Peter descends with his jetpack, notice how it makes his pathetic wee. Too sick to be pierced from the outside. Gamora uses the cut on the abelisk's neck to tear open the creature's stomach with her sword, freeing Drax and spewing thick yellow blood. Now, we've seen yellow liquid of this consistency before in Volume 1. The spinal fluid being mined from nowhere by the Tavant Corporation was the same color and consistency. And in Volume 3, Herbert Wyndham's facility has the same fluid running through it. And trailer footage shows Gamora cutting open a bear octopus hybrid, releasing similar color blood. My theory of Volume 3 is that Wyndham might be using celestial blood to engineer his creations and endow them with consciousness and intelligence. And perhaps these abelisks are similar creations with similar celestial light blood. One of the benefits of re-watching these movies as Rocket's story is just watching his expressions in every scene. Like here when Aisha lectures about how genetically perfect the Sovereign are. Every citizen is born exactly as designed by the community. Impeccable both physically and mentally. Yeah, on the word mentally, Rocket stifles a laugh because as an engineered being himself, he knows how mentally damaged that can make you. Might also be because when you see Elizabeth Debicki in close up, she does this crazy effect with her eyes where it looks like one eye is pointed one way while the other eye is facing another way, like what Bill Skarsgård does as Pennywise in It. I love the design of Aisha's throne. Like you think her headgear is a crown, but no, as she stands, it's part of the throne seat back and you can't really tell where her gown ends and the throne curtain begins. Aisha asks Peter about his heritage. I see it within you, an unorthodox genealogy, a hybrid that seems particularly reckless. Yes, family bloodlines is an important theme for this movie. As James Gunn has said, Volume 1 is about the mother, Volume 2 is about the father, and Volume 3 is going to be about the self. But thematically and physically in this movie, bloodlines are only as useful as an electrical circuit to a battery. Once the battery is dead, the circuit has no use for it. Talk more about this as we go. Rocket, our secret protagonist, takes particular offense to Aisha's eugenics talk. They told me you people were conceited douchebags, but that isn't true at all. Oh shit, I'm using my wrong eye again, aren't I? Yeah, like Aisha, Rocket's eyes are a little screwy too, but he ends this movie crying out of both of them. Peter changes into a shirt with text in the Xandarian language, translating to gears shift, and then in smaller text, dust, cement, stone, and ash, and then at the bottom, a Tiniac galaxy invention for Karen Tiniac, that's the film's wardrobe designer. As Peter awkwardly flirts with Gamora, Drax scares him by suddenly showing up beside him, a running joke with his ability to become invisible by standing very, very still. And if you rewind 10 seconds to the earlier shot, you can actually see Drax standing behind Peter in the 
shadows, none of us noticed it first time because he is nearly invisible there. The Sovereign fleet pursues after rockets stole the batteries. You saw how that high priestess talked down to us. Now I'm teaching her a lesson. Well, I didn't realize your motivation was altruism. Yeah, it sounds like Rocket was gonna steal the batteries anyway, but he initially cites his reason as a strike against the genetic superiority and egoism as a concept. I don't think he's fully lying since these end up being used to destroy a celestial bloodline and the ultimate ego. They have to pilot through a quantum asteroid field and Drax says to do so, he'd have to be the greatest pilot in the universe. Lucky for us. I am. I am. Yeah, right here, James Gunn is telling us of what seems like Peter Quill's story is actually Rocket's story. Rocket argues, I was cybernetically engineered to pilot a spacecraft. He was cybernetically engineered to be a douchebag. Huh, so Wyndham designed Rocket in part to pilot a spacecraft. He was made to be an explorer. But Quill is also right. Rocket was also built to be a little stinker. Drax uses a slap-on spacesuit to get towed in space and shoot the Sovereign fighter, setting up Chekhov's spacesuit for a Yondu sacrifice at the end of the movie. The remaining fighters are wiped out by Ego, riding his egg-shaped ship inspired by Mork's egg spaceship from Mork and Mindy, and one of many examples of reproductive imagery in this movie. The jump point is a hexagonal wormhole, part of the UNTN, that's the Universal Neural Transportation Network, introduced to the MCU in this movie and brought back in Captain Marvel, Avengers Endgame, and the upcoming The Marvels, when it seems to be broken. Again, the Guardians movies do all the heavy lifting of world building in the MCU. When they enter Bearheart's atmosphere, the Milano bursts into flame from the atmospheric friction, and if you look closely, so does Drax for a brief second, which is why you can hear him scream scream. <laughs> I also just now noticed that when the seat rips out the back of the Milano, it smacks into Drax. Rather than helping Gamora save Drax, Groot sits and eats candy in his seat. He's totally okay with Drax dying. I love how when the Milano violently crashes and stops to a halt, the forest remains still, but only when its wing falls off do these birds get disturbed from the bushes. The fluffy creatures on the branch are Veloos. They also show up in the I Am Groot short, The Little Guy on Grundar. Rocket's choice to steal the batteries comes back up. You know why I did it, Star Munch? Hmm? I'm not gonna answer Star much. I did it because I wanted to. But why did Rocket want to? Perhaps a mission to foil another celestial linked plot that involves his old girlfriend, Lila? I'm getting ahead of myself. So Ego steps out of his ship with Mantis and introduces himself as Peter's father. But we cut to Peter's real daddy, Yondu on Contraxia, looking out the window at the snowfall as Kraglin and the other Ravagers catch snowflakes in their mouths. Now that we know Kraglin and Yondu were told about Christmas by a young Peter Quill on the Guardians holiday special, one must wonder if Yondu is thinking about Peter. You know he is here. As Yondu zips up his pants, the reflection of the red neon light around him on the glass looks like the trail left by the Yaka arrow whenever it zips around him. In the background of this brothel, on the wall is a painting of Wall Russ, an engineer who helps Rocket Raccoon in the 80s Hulk comics. Howard the Duck returns in this scene, explaining why Howard marched out with the Ravagers from Contraxia when the portals opened in Endgame. Ravager leader Stakar Ogord appears, and I only now heard what he was saying as Yondu approaches. He's referring to his wife Alita Ogord, played by Michelle Yeoh in the final scene, and in the comics, Stakar and Alita merge their bodies to become Starhawk. Stakar shuns Yondu for dealing in kids, establishing this as one rule in the MCU cosmos that even the worst pirates refuse to break, no child trafficking. Which makes Ego, who did this countless times and piled his progeny's corpses on his own planetary body particularly perverse, just like dumping your batteries instead of recycling them. Unforgivable. Ego and Peter talk about why Yondu kept Peter. Because I was a skinny little kid who could squeeze into places adults couldn't, it made it easier for thieving. This sets up the same thing that Rocket will use for Groot in this film, a skinny little kid who can squeeze into places adults can't when Groot frees them on the Ravager's ship and when they use Groot to sneak the bomb into Ego's brain. And our fat butts ain't gonna fit through those tiny holes. And when Ego calls Rocket a triangle-faced monkey, Rocket self-consciously touches his nose, and I never notice how his eyes dart over to the side as he continues to watch Ego as he talks. Gamora reminds Peter of how he used to tell people his dad was David Hasselhoff. And you would tell all the other children that he was your father, but that he was out of town. Shooting Knight Rider or touring with his band in Germany. And later Peter says, When I was a kid, I used to pretend David Hasselhoff was my dad. He's a singer and actor from Earth, really famous guy. Yeah, Peter always remembers that Hasselhoff was a singer first, actor second. Rocket repairs the Milano with a spray that James Gunn called an expensive and sophisticated 3D printer, something that Rocket stole, that he said takes time and patience to use. Pretty sad to think that Rocket spends so much time encoding the ship's exact layout, like one would a Roomba, because he never wants it to change. He wants the family to stay together. But Peter breaks up the family in the scene. He fundamentally changes the dynamic. And as he does so, we hear one of my favorite songs, Fleetwood Mac's The Chain, one of the all-time best 
breakup songs because Fleetwood Mac was recording rumors as they were all getting divorced. The chain is about the idea of breaking up in a relationship, breaking the chain. We saw this chain forged at the end of volume one and for the first time it's coming apart because Peter is choosing biological family over his found family. And listen how sad Rocket is here. Shoot her if she does anything suspicious. Mm -hmm. Or if you feel like it. Okay. He refuses to talk to them because they're leaving him. They meet Mantis, who puts Ego's mind at ease to allow him to sleep, but really empathically absorbing his genocidal guilt. He lies awake at night thinking about his progeny. Yes, progeny is singular and plural, masking the fact that Peter isn't the only one of Ego's children. Now, the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special confirms that Mantis is also Ego's offspring, hinted at in this movie by one of Ego's mates being the exact same race as Mantis. There's actually a deleted scene from this movie with Kurt Russell that would have confirmed this. All of the members of the Guardians of the Galaxy, it seems like, more and more, have a direct celestial link. And that includes Rocket! And you may have noticed, yes, I did switch shirts, into a deep dive exclusive Rocket Science 89P13 inspired design. There's a lot of on Easter eggs hidden on this shirt, and it is the best way to support us here at The Deep Dive so that we can continue doing this every week. So please grab one of these at nerdriot.shop. Now, when I am doing research, part of the fun is going down every rabbit hole I can find, and to do that, I need ExpressVPN. We have been using it for years on New Rockstars, and it's something that we rely on to create all this content for you guys. Streaming services like Netflix hide thousands of shows and movies from you based on your location, and while it'd be great to just hop on a plane to the UK or to Japan to watch them all, it's much easier to just use ExpressVPN. With ExpressVPN, I can control which country Netflix thinks I am in with a single click. There are over 90 countries to choose from, so every time I run out of stuff to watch, I just switch to another country to unlock new shows. For this video, I wanted to check whether or not the sequence might have been referencing Jurassic Park, which isn't on US Netflix currently, but with just one tap of a button, ExpressVPN lets me change my location to Germany to watch it. And it's not just for Netflix, you can use ExpressVPN to unlock shows on other streaming services too. I like to use it to watch Graham Norton on BBC iPlayer, it's free and it's only available in the UK. ExpressVPN is also super fast and it works on your phone, laptop, even smart TVs so that you can watch your shows from the comfort of your couch or on the go with zero buffering. No wonder ExpressVPN has already been called the best VPN of 2023. So if you want to get more out of your streaming subscriptions, ExpressVPN is a must have. Make sure you go to expressvpn.com slash the deep dive. You'll get an extra three months of ExpressVPN free. Trust me, it's totally worth it. Okay, so as the Ravagers capture them on Bearheart, Yandu tells Rock it. I tell you, it was pretty easy to find you. I put a tracer on your ship back there during the war over Xander. Very interesting line, because it means that for these three months since the end of the first film, Yandu has known where Peter and Rocket have been, but he chose to kick back on Contraxia and not hunt down his boy. He only went after him after Aisha's offer in front of the other Ravagers forced his hand. The rest arrive at Ego's planet, set to George Harrison's My Sweet Lord, and like all encounters with gods, the experience is a mix of vibrant beauty and Old Testament destructive power. Drax pops a single bubble that divides and divides into countless more foreshadowing Ego's plan to expand himself across the universe. And those dome structures on the planet look like half-buried skulls, foreshadowing the skulls of Ego's progeny buried underneath. Ego calls himself a Celestial, but unlike the other MCU Celestials, the armored giants of Erishim, Aeson, Tiamat, and the rest, Ego claims his earliest memory was as a floating brain in space, based on the concept of the Boltzmann brain, something that you might have seen in Futurama, a concept in which it's theoretically likelier for us to be brains that spontaneously appear in space, forming our realities around our ourselves than it is that countless independent beings came together and shared this reality. You can imagine Ego subscribes to this concept wholesale. No one else really matters, it's just reality that's been divorced from him that he needs to rejoin to his own consciousness. The movie Eternals explained the primary celestial birthing process, but Ego sounds like an older celestial separate from the others seeking a loophole by which to reproduce, to explain to Peter how he conceived him with Meredith, and Peter glows in her womb with that blue color, the same color of Ego's life force, his celestial light, showing how Ego really sees Peter Peter as a battery to use. Meanwhile, this young pink-skinned humanoid life form that Ego met is actually a cameo by James Gunn's niece, Grace. Taserface mutinies Yandu and his loyal crewmates, and we spend a solid beat watching as ice envelops their faces. This is from Captain Yandu's point of view, and he's coming to terms with the fact that sometimes a pirate just has to let the coldness of space take over you, setting up why he's okay later making that ultimate sacrifice play. Nebula tells Kraglin how Thanos pit her and Gamora against each other. Every time my sister prevailed, my father would replace a piece of me with machinery, claiming he wanted me to be her equal. Like Peter Quill in Rocket, Nebula was treated by her father as a box of scraps. Her rage against her father is the same Rocket feels toward Herbert Wyndham, and the same as Peter feels toward Ego. I will hunt my father like a dog and I will tear him apart slowly, piece by piece. 
And like Thanos, Ego only cares about progeny that serve a practical purpose for him. Like even playing Celestial Lightball Catch is a battery test. Take your brain to the center of this planet. Up until this point, we've just seen performative guilt from Ego, and only now does he show true unfiltered excitement toward Peter. It shows that Ego wasn't really interested in a relationship with his son, only in how charged this battery is. Part of the broken toys theme is characters commenting on each other's physical looks with the schoolyard cruelty in this film. I'm sorry, I took it too far. I meant trash panda. Is that better? I don't know. It's worse. It's so much worse. I am hideous? You are horrifying to look at, yes. You smiled, and for a second I got a warm feeling, but then it was ruined by those disgusting ass teeth. It seems as though crossing paths with Aisha and her genetic superiority left everyone in this movie with a form of body dysmorphia and a superficial judgment of each other's looks. Groot even gets abused by the Ravagers for being too cute. Hey, what about this little plant? Can I smash it with a rock? No, Jeff. It's too adorable to kill. But becoming a mascot allows Groot to be left uncaged in this part of the movie and exploited for being small and good for Theban in this film, which is how they use him in the final act. This smallness might have left him with a self-consciousness that turned him into swole Groot later in life. Groot brings Yondu and Rocket Yondu's underwear, then an Orloni, then Vorker's eye, a callback to the first film when Rocket wanted it for his final battle plan. That guy's eye. No, seriously, I need it. And I pointed out in my volume one analysis, Rocket is obsessed with broken parts out of resentment for his own existence as a box of scraps. And I love here how the eye shifts back and forth as Rocket laughs. He's gonna wake up tomorrow and he's not gonna know where his eye is. <laughs> Groot opens the drawer with a backup pin, but he grabs a candy dish. This is marked with scroll letters translating to candy, and on the side rim, it's fun to eat. There's scroll language all over the set of this movie, and Rocket and Yondu sell when they rearm Yondu with his pin. The scroll lettering on the back wall reads A, B, C, D, and in Teenage Groot's post credit scene, one of the scroll markings on his bedroom wall translate to you. According to James Gunn, many of the I am Groots in this movie is bad language, and in volume three, we will get the MCU's first F-bomb. Now what? Open the Door. Now, during their escape, whenever an arrow cuts through a Ravager, I just noticed it does an unnecessary loop, kind of like a victory lap, celebrating being back with Yondu. Like the woman dancer and Jay and the Americans come a little bit closer, that's playing during the scene, the arrow is celebrating being back with her man after flirting with a stranger. Rocket pulls up a tablet of planet locations, Dreslar, Hala, Terma, and Terra. Now, Terra is another name for Earth. Hala is the homeworld of the Kree Empire seen in Captain Marvel. Terma is where Adam Warlock is found in the Annihilation Conquest storyline that these movies are really based on. Dreslar is another Kree colony that's part of that storyline. They take the UNTN past a couple warring Cronins, that's a race of Korg. Later they fly past Stan Lee hanging out with a bunch of Watchers. This is the same race as Uatu from What If. Before I was so rudely interrupted, at that time I was a Federal Express man. He's referring to his cameo as a FedEx delivery guy in Captain America Civil War, a movie that technically doesn't take place until two years after this, but Stan Lee can transcend all of time and space. Peter tries to recreate his fooled around and fell in love moment with Gamora, now on Ego's planet. The rainbow color of the scene casts Peter in the artificial light of Ego's atmosphere. It all feels very fake and phony and ready to be destroyed, like what we saw in the 838 universe, Multiverse Madness, or on Asgard. If something seems to be too good to be true, it's probably not long for this universe. But once Peter goes inside, notice how his skin glows golden in this room's light. I finally found my family! Don't you understand that? I thought you already had. This gold skin makes him look like a bloodline obsessed sovereign. It's a sickness that really has infected all the guardians here. But right after this, Gamora sits in a desert, two reeds scratching against each other and annoyed, she cuts them. She doesn't want any reminder of two things dancing together like she and Peter did, but ironically, she and her sister are about to brush back against each other and they have an insane fight in this movie. Meanwhile, Ego manipulates Peter the way a returning father would to his child. He gives him dreams of a giant Pac-Man and Heather Locklear and begins to reveal the truth. I told you how all those years ago, I had an unceasing impulse to find life. But what I did not tell you was how when I finally did find it, it was all so disappointing. Ego is really a cautionary tale for what happens when god-tier beings like Celestials try to walk among mortals. Gods and monsters, again, isn't just James Gunn's name for his DC Universe Phase 1, it's also the theme of this Guardians trilogy. Those who seek godliness will always fall to those who embrace their monstrosity. So while the Ego activates Peter, Eternity. 
Sean has said that it's a lowercase e, not meant to be the actual cosmic entity of eternity, but the idea is the same. Ego and Peter, despite being celestials, are not meant to see all of eternity. They're hacking into a forbidden truth. Celestials are not mortal. We've seen celestials die. Nowhere, Tiamat, celestials are not forever. They're not meant to see eternity. So now when we look back at Peter's eyes filling black, it's not a beautiful sight. Think about it. It's really a horrifying way to show someone devoid of a soul. No, 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 no. Oh, and so structurally linked with this moment is the truth of Ego's monstrosity. cave has the shape of a giant eye, as if Ego's keeping a close full watch on his victims, but he still doesn't care. The pile of bones and skulls include a bunch of Easter eggs according to James Gunn. I was able to see a Gungan skull from Star Wars on the lower left there, what looks like the skull of Stitch from Lilo and Stitch on the lower right, and in a set photo right in the middle of the pile, what looks like the skull of Donald Duck, maybe Howard the Duck, but Howard the Duck's eyes aren't that big. And back to Yondu and Rocket arguing from the opening clip. I know you steal batteries you don't need, and you push away anyone who's willing to put up with you, cause just a little bit of love reminds you how big and empty that hole inside you actually is. I said shut up! I know them scientists what made you never gave a rat's ass about you! I'm serious! Guess batteries you don't need and scientists that made Rocket. I think two big clues for Volume 3 that tell us that Yondu knew that Rocket was made by Herbert Wyndham's group of scientists, telling us that Wyndham ain't exactly hiding. And yes, this idea of the batteries. Stealing the batteries is what kicks off the whole plot for Volume 3, because Aisha and Adam Warlock are still chasing them. So why does Rocket steal the batteries? For many reasons! But one of them is to have some godly control over his own life. It's similar to Ego's goal, what he calls the expansion, spreading his celestial influence all over the known universe. And in addition to Mantis's mother, that green razor tentacled mate in the bottom center could be an Oscavarian, the race that Peter admitted to hooking up with in volume one, like father, like son. Oscavari actually comes up again in this movie. We're in an old piece of construction equipment Yandu once used to slice open the bank of Oscavaria. Ego says that of all of his spawn, only Peter carried the celestial gene, the connection to the light, which tells us that there must have been something special about Meredith Quill. Ego isn't really the exceptional one. Meredith was. Ego confesses, It broke my heart to put that tumor in her head. What? Yeah, James Gunn uses a dolly zoom on Peter, framing this realization as the most horror-filled moment of the film. And as Peter's eyes clear, the camera effect also causes Chris Pratt's face to appear thinner. He is literally transforming back into a being that exists in this dimension, someone more focused with arrow-like precision on his next target. And ironically, planting a destructive force in Ego's brain will be how they avenge Meredith. Peter wastes no time blasting Ego, using the element guns given to him by Yondu, his real daddy. And Ego messes with Peter's mind by morphing briefly into David David Hasselhoff himself. You killed my mother! I tried so hard to find the form that best suited you! Yeah, the Hoff is wearing his Knight Rider outfit, complete with the K on the belt buckle. And this really tells us that Ego's form as we know it is really just a composite of 80s heroes that Peter would have grown up with and admired. Hasselhoff appears in the credits as the form of David Hasselhoff, and he actually shows up singing the original song Guardians Inferno during the credits, written by James Gunn and Tyler Bates. Also in the credits is Cosmo the Space Dog, Jeff Goldblum making his MCU debut ahead of Ragnarok as the Grand Master, Howard the Duck, and throughout the credits, the words I am Groot appear over many names, and the credits end with the customary no raccoons or tree creatures were harmed, but adds that the same cannot be said for the Tamers. Ego impales Peter with his celestial light. I wanted to do this together! But I suppose you'll have to learn by spending the next thousand years as a battery! Now the sad thing is, treating their bloodlines as thousand year batteries to spread their influence as far as possible is really how many patriarchs view their kids' primary functions. While Ego's face was previously hidden from the planet's surface before, now as the others approach, it now has Kurt Russell's face, just as Ego's planetary form takes in the comics. But when given the opportunity to escape, Peter redirects them to bore into Ego's surface, and Rocket doesn't question it. He uses the ship's laser spheres to conduct a kind of invasive surgery, even sacrificing the Anulax batteries to use as a detonator. Rocket knows that greatest use for these is to slay a celestial, a class of god that has only brought the universe pain. Of course I care about the planets and the buildings and all the animals on the planets and the people. 
as we saw in Rocket's cynical judgment of the Xandarians in Volume 1, he cares less for humanoids made in the celestial image than animals like him cursed into existence and perceived to be lower on the angelic hierarchy. Monsters, not gods. Nebula uses her arm to recharge the laser generator, taking out the Sovereign fleet, destroying their own ship, and Yondu survives by whistling for his arrow and clicking his heels together. I'm very popular, y'all! In this sets up the triumphant team circle shot, but moving the opposite direction as a circle up shot in the 2012 Avengers film. Notice how Nebula fixes her broken nose, Peter and Gamora reunite with sparks behind them, like that spark rain that fell behind them as they fooled around and fell in love on Nowhere in Volume 1, and this hero shot buttons with the gag of Mantis getting hit with debris. Groot finds his way to the core by following the celestial light. When many asked why Groot becomes swole Groot in the Guardians Holiday Special and in Volume 3, compared to his father's skinny adult form in Volume 1, I theorized it might be because Flora Colossi feed via photogenesis, and that this Groot progeny has been exposed to celestial light from the core here in the scene, from Peter, from Mantis, and perhaps from Rocket. As Ego regains the upper hand across the universe, his goo continues to spread, and Missouri, the older couple taking pictures, are James Gunn's parents, credited as Weird Old Man and Weird Old Man's Mistress in the credits. Gunn's brother, his wife, and their three kids are right beside them, and they also get mowed over by the goo. We cut to part of the Xandarian Empire with a ship that is part of the Nova Corps, and another planet with the yellow-skinned race played by Gunn's niece and his brother-in-law. When the goo stops, the old man driving the inclined car is actually Peter's grandfather from Volume 1, played by Greg Henry. He shows up again dancing in the closing credits. There's actually a deleted scene from this Missouri sequence that would have shown a cinema with Nathan Fillion in movie posters as Simon Williams, aka Wonder Man, a superhero stuntman actor in various film roles. Rocket pulls a really cool move in the sequence that I only just now realized. He takes the laser emitters off the spheres and sticks them to the rocks on Ego's tendrils, and then he creates an interlock sphere shield around himself and then detonates those explosives. He is using what he learned from the interlocking Nova Corps, as well as Groot's protective shield from the 2014 film to pull off this move. It ends with him calling back his, oh yeah, but he doesn't get to stick the landing fully. Yeah. I just find this interesting because Yondu throughout this final sequence is trying to tell Peter that he doesn't need to control the arrow with his head, but with his heart. And he only says that because Peter is too stupid to rely on his brain. It's a brain that he inherited from Ego. What he really needs is the power of Meredith's heart to guide him. But Rocket is much smarter than Peter is. He can rely on a masterful brain again and again, and it serves this secret protagonist of this trilogy quite well. But Peter, trusting his heart, freeing himself from Ego's brain, flashes back to memories, listening to the mixtape with his mom, laughing with Drax, falling in love with Gamora, flying with Rocket and Groot in an interesting early instance of Yondu teaching him to use those element guns. They brought back Wyatt Olaf to play young Peter in these flashbacks. He would go on to play young Stanley Uris in the It movies, and Fleetwood Max the Chain comes back here, filling the promise of Peter never breaking the chain. Ego's stranglehold on each of the Guardians loosens. Around Groot, you can see his branches and leaves in the surrounding rock, showing how Groot was briefly part of this assimilation. Of the two buttons on the detonator, the one Rocket told him not to push on the right is cracked. Groot chooses the correct one on the left, but it might just be because he wanted to choose the whole uncracked one, disliking the idea of anything being broken, like family. Ego and Peter continue to brawl. Ego forms a large version of himself. Peter delivers on his promise to make a giant Pac-Man, essentially giving us gods versus monsters. You are a god. If you kill me, you'll be just like everybody else. What's so wrong with that? The bomb explodes in the brain, and Ego implodes in Peter's hands, cast in the color of gold once more, but sovereign genetic superiority crumbling into dust. Yondu saves Peter. He may have been your father, boy, but he wasn't your daddy. And Peter can only watch as Yondu freezes over and dies. Remember, Peter had made a similar sacrifice to save Gamora in Volume 1, so he knows that this is an act of pure selfless love. During Yondu's funeral, his figurines include that jewel frog that he stole from Xandar in Volume 1, the troll doll Peter trolled him with, and really all the ones we saw in the past, including this little green alien. This guy was given to Yondu by young Peter as a Christmas present in the holiday special. They cover Yondu's face with several U.S. military service pins, Air Force and Army captain's bars, an army ribbon for good conduct, the National Defense Service Medal, and on that green cloth across his mouth, an Air Force Missile Maintenance Badge, aka a pocket rocket. This is awarded to specialists who have worked with guided missiles, and this is over his mouth, where he would whistle to guide that pocket rocket, Yaka Arrow. But if you look closely though, during the scene, the first hand to light a candle in this funeral is a furry paw of Rocket. Both Rocket and Peter are losing a father figure here. Craglin gives Peter the Zune that will carry on this trilogy's musical legacy in Volume 3, and the first song that Peter plays on it is Cat Stevens' Father and Son. Now this song's lyrics are a dialogue between a wise father 
and a son trying to break away and forge his own destiny. In a 1973 Rolling Stone interview, the songwriter said, Some people think that I was taking the son's side, but how could I have sung the father's side if I couldn't have understood it too? I was listening to the song recently, and I heard one line and realized that that was my father's 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 father speaking. The point is, at least in my view, this song is not a dialogue. It's a monologue. One man reflecting on the irony of thinking he was the only kid ever to rebel against his father, only to grow older and realize that every father gets rebelled against some day. I feel like I'm back in my interstellar analysis making this about my dad, but James Gunn has said that the first movie was about the mother and the second movie is about the father. And I cannot help but listen to this song and think about my dad, who was once like I am now, and he knows that it's not easy to be calm when he found something going on. But take your time, think a lot, think of everything you've got, for you will still be here tomorrow, but your dreams may not. And it's interesting because the son persona of the song doesn't hear any of this wisdom. They fight back against their dad. And the final line of the chorus, I know, I have to go. It sounds like it's coming from the point of view of the son, someone who knows he has to leave his father behind, but it's also something coming from the father who knows that he has to drop this lecture and let his son go. Yondu's sacrifice gains him the fires of Ogord ritual, including salutes from all Ravager captains, Stakar Ogord, Alita Ogord, Charlie 27, and they're joined in the post credit scene by other captains, Mainframe, voiced by Miley Cyrus, and Kruger, who's a Lem sorcerer from Earth 691 in the comics, actually the Sorcerer Supreme, who practices the same mystic arts as Doctor Strange, he's going to return in Volume 3. And though all of these characters watch the fires of Ogord, we end with Rocket, whose final spoken line in this movie is really odd. Rocket says, He didn't chase them away, even though he yelled at them, and he was always mean, and he stole batteries he didn't need. Yeah, Rocket's beginning his line talking about Yondu, but since Yondu told him that they were the same, Rocket accidentally slips into talking about himself. Rocket realizes it was his choice to steal those batteries that led to all this trouble. Trouble that they're still in to this day, since in another post credit scene, Aisha cocoons Adam Warlock, who hunts the Guardians of Volume 3. So what was the real point of those batteries? Remember, the batteries are the most powerful energy source in the universe, and I think it's because they are derived from celestials, and I believe so is Rocket. As of this taping, I have not seen Volume 3 yet. I could be totally wrong about this, but Rocket's creator, Herbert Wyndham, might have used yellow celestial brain fluid, the kind siphoned by the Collector on Nowhere, and now showing up in Wyndham's facility in Volume 3, brain fluid to endow his creations, like Rocket, with consciousness. Consciousness being a gift from the divine. In this story of gods and monsters, these monsters are more directly linked to gods than they thought. Their brokenness, I believe, comes from their godliness. They are metaphorically and literally celestial batteries who blow shit up to save the the universe like Promethean gods stealing fire from Mount Olympus. Our final shot shows not Peter Quill, but our secret protagonist of Rocket. I have to go. It's our secret protagonist who knows that he has to go. And as we look ahead to volume three, Rocket will go and reunite with his creator, the high evolutionary Herbert Wyndham, to confront that daddy on how someone who claims to be a god could treat his son as nothing more than a battery. And again, I am wearing our 89P13 inspired Rocket Science shirt. Get one of these at nerdriot.shop. It's honestly the best way to support this channel so that I can continue doing this. Next Friday, May 5th, noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific, will be my live breakdown and Q&A of Guardians of the Galaxy volume three. So be sure to tune in. Subscribe here to the deep dive, turn notifications on, share this channel and its videos with everyone you know. Follow me at EA Boss. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time, my divers of the deep.